that. Well, I'm excited. I hope you're excited as well. We are starting a new sermon series this week. We're going to be in the book of Ruth, and I am going to be in the book of Ruth pretty much exclusively for the next uh, five weeks. So if you just want to open your Bibles to the book of Ruth or flip open your iPhone or your iPad or your uh, Android phone to, uh, to Ruth, we're going to walk our way today through Ruth 1. Um, the reality of the matter is I could probably spend the next four or five weeks doing an introduction to the book of Ruth, despite it being about a 12-minute read. Because Ruth is an awesome book of the Bible. I love the book of Ruth. There's, it, it, it's perhaps the most beautiful story in all of Scripture. I, I just love the story of Ruth. And, and as you dig into the story of Ruth, um, you find it's kind of like an onion, not in the bad sense to make you cry, but uh, in the sense that it has layers. And as you peel back those differing layers, there's, there's so much richness and depth to the book of Ruth. And, and that's why, as I said, I, I think I could probably spend four or five weeks just telling you about the book of Ruth before even telling you anything about the book of Ruth in actuality, because there's just so much good stuff there. I'm going to do stuff a little bit different over these weeks. We're going to, I'm going to read the text. We're going to walk through the text. You're going to hear from my heart uh, as your pastor. And we're going to learn from the lives of some amazing people as we walk through this. And, and as I said, follow along. You know, if you don't have a Bible, grab a Bible. There's a few in the Welcome Center. There's some in the pews. Um, just stick your finger in there. If you don't know where the Book of Ruth is, because it's short, it can be hard to find. It's on page 475. Okay, in my Bible. Um, it comes right after Judges. And uh, that's an intentional placing of the book of Ruth after Judges because the book of Ruth occurs during the time of Judges. And we'll get more into that. But it comes right after Judges. So you can see it's not too far into the Old Testament there. Um, it, it, but it is, in my Bible, like four pages. And it's sandwiched between Judges and Samuel. So if you're looking for it, that's where you will find it if you don't know where Ruth is, is located in your Bible. So if you'll open up to that and follow along, it's going to be, uh, I think, a fun ride. I'm looking forward to it. And we're going to spend the next few weeks just digging in to this. And the reason for that is Ruth is this just tremendous story of redemption, which lends itself so very nicely as a walking path into this season. As we get towards Lent and Easter, it begins to prepare our hearts and our minds for this grand story of redemption that's woven through the Bible that we, that we spend so much time focusing and, and, and celebrating at Easter. But uh, there's so much more even to it than just what we study at Easter. It comes from the Old Testament. It weaves its way all the way from the beginning to the end of the Bible. And so when we get to the book of Ruth here, it's, it's, just, it's a fun stopping point to just dig in and, and see this story of the redemption that God works and the way that God works in this story. And, and I, I fully believe this is going to be a good series. So invite your friends, your neighbors, your family. If you miss a week, watch it online. Make sure you stay up. Uh, I believe it will be challenging for us. And, and I believe that if we take to heart the lessons and principles and ideas that we see in this series, uh, that God is going to bear some amazing fruit through it. So Let's get started. We're going to jump off. I'll read a little passage of scripture and then we'll circle back and I'll talk about it. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, as we walk through the verses. <clears throat> this is the word of God from the book of Ruth. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and his wife was Naomi and the names of their two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Epaphrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and, re and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The names of one was or Orpah. I'm going to say Oprah, I'm sure. Orpah. It's easy to make that mistake. Orpah. And the name of the other was Ruth. That one's easier. They lived there about ten years. And both Malon and Chilion died, so that the women were left without her two sons and her husband. And I'll pause there, and we will dig in. So looking at verse 1, it tells us right to begin with, in the days when the judges rule. This is where we're getting our historical timeline. It's kind of placing it for us. This is the period of judges. And in all likelihood, this happens early, early, early in the time of the book of Judges. 
Um, this goes back to the lineage of Jesus and Rahab, who was the mother in this story of the man in the story. Sorry, a little tangent, tangential thought there. But nonetheless, um, that's why we think it's early on in the book, in the time of Judges, because of its having to be located with her, with Rahab. You remember Rahab, she's one who kind of gives protection to the Israelites as they come over the wall, and, and uh, she gets saved, and the rest of the city gets, gets stormed and rampaged. Um, again, I'm off topic already, so this is going to take a while, sorry. <laughs> so that's why we think it's early in the book, um, early in the time of Judges. And, and the period of Judges, if you're not familiar with it, that comes from the time at the death of Joshua. Remember, Joshua leads the Israelites into the Promised Land. So it comes from the time of the death of Joshua up until the point of the coronation of Saul as king of Israel. And if you want to know more about this time, simply just go back when you go home, read the book of Judges. The book of Judges is an interesting read. It's a fascinating read, in fact. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a heavy read. It is historical. And it's also a little bit of a depressing read um, because as you read the book of Judges, you will see this is perhaps the darkest period in the history of Israel. The darkest, most wicked, most evil things that the Israelites and their leaders do fall during this time period. Um, this time period, they were, they were surrounded by many non, non-Yahweh following, following other tribes and countries. And rather than living as salt and light, as a true countercultural example to those outside groups, rather than doing that, if you read the book of Judges, you find they repeatedly succumb to these outside influences. Instead of being the influencer, they take on the nature of those around them. And so they repeatedly succumb to temptation, particularly uh, sexual temptations and wickedness. And the result of these sins is that from, from one generation to the next, that they, they, they grow in rebellion. This is that part of the Bible where you see frequently, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. When you are having your eulogy read someday at your funeral, you don't want it to include those words, right? And he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And that's what we know about these men, these leaders from that time period. They did almost all of them with a few, few, few exceptions, but almost all of them did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They were bad leaders leading bad people doing wicked and evil and horrible and terrible things. And these were the people of God, Right? the Israelites. And so um, it is a dark period as you read through Judges. And, and it's hard to even find in that period what a follower of the one true God should look like. And so we look at this book with that as kind of the backdrop, that, the, 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 the contrast of the mess that they were making in the world and the mess of the world around them but also realizing humbly that this is the story of God's people. And more often than not, we are no better than they were. So we have to be cautious before we're too judgmental about how evil they were. Well, our world has a lot of problems and we too at times succumb to temptation. But continuing on, it says, there was a famine in the land, right? Now the scriptures do not specifically state it, but it causes me to wonder here as we go through this, if this famine is a response of God to the people turning their back on him. Because frequently that is one of the ways in which God brought his judgment. We find this in other places of scripture. Um, where, where as God brings judgment on a group of people, famine comes. And if they refuse to obey him, he refused to bless them with rain or with successful crops. And so it's interesting in that sense to see that I, I suspect this is the case. As I have read this and as I've worked through this in Bible studies and as I've studied this in seminary and the more I read about the book of Ruth, the more convinced I am that, that God is intentionally sending this famine in this time to get the people's attention so that they would turn back to him, so that they would rely upon him, so they would put their hope and trust in him and not their own abilities to raise and grow crops. And then through that, 
restore right relationship with their God. Then it says, And a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, they went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now in this story, there's many great literary forms. And one of the really amazing forms of literature that they use here is is the form of irony. There's humor, there is irony in the Bible. And, And if you don't know the background... Uh, The city of Bethlehem, the name Bethlehem itself, literally means house of bread, okay? So it's it's house of wonder bread. It's the wonderful loaf, right? How many of you loved wonder bread as a kid? I loved wonder bread as a kid, right? Do they even make wonder bread anymore? I don't even know. But I'm too old. They don't let me eat it, right? All that that processed, refined, white, sugar, bread stuff. But Bethlehem means house of bread. So here in the story, we have people literally from house of bread with nothing to eat. You see the irony, right? And so um, the story here focuses on this single family where the husband has to make a tough decision about moving his family to go and find food. He's thinking to himself, do I stay here? Do I wait it out? Do I suffer through this time of just not having enough? Or I've heard down the road a spell, about 50 miles away, there's still some abundance. In fact, things are going really well down in Moab. Stuff is growing, the rain is falling, crops are grand. And that further, I think, illustrates my belief that I think God is sending his judgment on the people. Because just down the road, the weather is good and the crops are great. But right here where the Israelites are staying, not so good. So he's thinking, do I stay? Do I go? Do I take my family? What do I do here? And and this too is where we might, uh, you know, um, we might readily say, oh yeah, you go down the road. You jump, right? You got to feed your family, right? But there's more layers. Like I said, this is kind of like an onion. Just because the soil is fertile down there, just because the rain is falling, there's something bigger underlying that's going on. And what this man chooses to do, Elimelech, uh, what he chooses to do is, rather than deal with the bigger problem, which is the sin issue in the believers of Yahweh, the one true God, rather than address the problem that has brought the drought, he runs away. And I tell you what, Running away from God never solves problems. You may think it will, and temporarily it might bring you relief, but in the long run, running from God never works out for your benefit. And so what he does is he chooses to run. He chooses to go. He takes his family the 50 miles down the road, and and at first glance you might think this doesn't look to be that big of an error, but it is a tragic and and terrible, terrible error as we will see. Because you see, Moab, Moab was a place, as an Israelite, you were not supposed to dwell under any circumstances, period. No ambiguity. If you were a follower of Yahweh, you didn't live in Moab. And there's no questioning it. If you don't know the story of the Moabites, another interesting story, if you want to go back into Genesis, uh, Genesis 19, and read the story, you remember Lot, right? Right? Lot and his wife turned to the pillar of salt. You remember that from Sunday school as a kid? She looks back and turns to salt. That's an interesting story. Well, Lot's two daughters have this idea and they want to reproduce and they have an incestuous relationship with Lot. And as a result of that, one of the sons that is born is Moab. And the Moabites and the Ammonites, who are the two offspring that come from this forbidden relationship, they get, Moab, they, get, they get Lot drunk and take advantage of him. Those two sons, the Moabites and the Ammonites, will, for the rest of the history of Israel, be a thorn in their side. And so under no circumstances should the people of God be walking down the road to go live with these Moabites. Because... They are God-forsaken. They are following 
wildly other gods. They are attacking and warring with the Israelites. They are constantly, constantly a problem. So Elimelech should have known better. But yet, he takes his family 50 miles down the road and makes this tragic mistake of moving them there. And when he moves his family there, he moves them away from the other people of God, of the Yahweh God. He moves them away from family and friends. He moves them away from their their worshiping, so to speak, church community. He moves them away from all the accountability that comes living with other Jews to a place where they will be the only family of God. That's a problem. The story continues on in verse 2. It tells us now that the man's name was Elimelech. His wife was Naomi. They had two sons, Malon and Kilion, and they were Paphrathites, which is the old name for Bethlehem in Judah. And they went to Moab and they lived there. Now, if you, if you understand, and we've talked about this a little bit before, names in the Old Testament matter, okay? They're not accidental names. And the name Elimelech means, my God is king, all right? So every time he hears his name, every time he says his name, hi, my name's Elimelech, he says, hi, my God is king, right? Okay, my God is king. So when he's walking around in Moab, how do you think that goes over? Because you see the Moabites, they worship Chemosh, a a foul god. If you want to look up Chemosh, do it on your own time at home. But he walks around, hi, my name is my god, it's king. That's probably not going to go so well for him, right? Now, his wife Naomi has a beautiful name. Naomi, you got a beautiful name. Naomi means pleasant. It means sweetheart. It means sweetie, right? She's a gem of a woman. A lovely woman, right? And and we'll see that more as we dig in and continue on. But uh, Naomi literally means she's a sweetheart. Everybody likes Naomi, right? Then we get to the kids. We get to the boys. And if you're having children or your grandchildren, you know, if your kids are having kids and they're looking for biblical names, don't pick these two names. Okay? And I'll tell you why. Here's the names. It's Malon, which would be weird, and Kilion, or Kilion, or Chilion, depending on how much chutzpah you have if you're Jewish. I don't have that. But Kilion and Malon. And again, the names have meanings, and if you dig into it, Malon literally means sick and dying. And Kilion also means death and destruction. So when you're walking up and you're introducing your kids to their first grade teacher, you're like, this is my son walking pneumonia and my other son Ebola, (laughs) right? (sighs) Don't choose those for your kids' names. Also, rule out Nebuchadnezzar, and I've got a few others if you're taking notes, but don't pick these two names. And it says they were Paphrathites, which was the Old Testament name for Bethlehem. And so they went to Moab and they lived there. Now, if you're listening, guys, um, Elimelech serves as a tremendous negative example of how our decisions as men leading our families can affect our families in a very negative way. Uh, how, how bad decisions on our part can lead our entire family astray, our wives and our children. And speaking specifically to the men, but it's a truth principle for everyone, but specifically for us men, the Bible calls us to lead our families well, to put food on the table, a roof over our heads, and take care of the basic needs of our wife and children, right? God has entrusted us with that responsibility. And Elimelech here serves as a negative example of a man who did not count the cost spiritually of the decisions that he was going to be making. See, Elimelech saw the short-term gain. Elimelech thought, if I take my family down the road, problem solved. We'll get some food, right? But there was more to the story. And perhaps he ignored, he didn't realize, but I doubt that's the case. I think he intentionally chose to disregard the fact that long-term, his decision was a bad choice. And, And I point this out specifically because we have a responsibility that the choices we make leading our families matter. 
where we choose to live, who we choose to associate with, where we choose to go to church, and the other things that come with the decisions that God has entrusted us with, it matters. Where we live is going to make a difference in who our kids are probably going to marry. While, yes, people like myself go and find a wife many hours away from where they live in this day and age, most people still find somebody relatively close to where they're located. While I had moved six hours away, I was only a half hour away from my wife when we met. So proximity still matters. Where we choose to live, how we choose to live, who we choose to hang out with, what we choose to do, when and where and why we go to church, all those things matter. And they can have a lasting and long-term impact, both for the positive and for the negative. We see the negative here. So Elimelech decides to leave his church, leave his family behind, leave fellowship, leave accountability in the pursuit of short-term gain. And as many of us men are prone to do, he only counts the financial cost, the short-term cost of relocating his family to Moab, glossing over or ignoring, like I said, the bigger impact. Verse 3, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, dies, right? And she's left with her two sons. So he moves to Moab so they wouldn't die. Do you see the irony again? And what happens? He dies. He, he moves his family to avoid famine, to avoid potential death, and he dies anyhow. Moral of the story, death is in God's hands and not in ours. We don't know how he died, it doesn't say. Old age, heart attack, got hit by a camel, I don't know. Right? We don't know. But if you're wondering, why did he die? Was it natural causes? Was it God's curse? What was it? Again, Scripture doesn't give us anything to go off of. God is silent. The Bible says that the secret things are for the Lord, that we only know in part, but everything we need to know we are given, and we're not given this, so I guess we don't need to know. And in this we have to live by faith and trust God, because in the end, God knows what he's doing, and we don't. But this is such a drastic change in direction in the story, right? You think, okay, if you're reading this story at home, you're like, oh, they're going to go get some food. Everything's going to be great. And he's dead. Just that quick. We're only in verse 3. Now, Elimelech died, and he leaves his wife and two sons behind. So you're thinking, there must be some hope still, right? Her two sons are there to look out for her to protect her, to provide for her. That was, that was their responsibility now that they were the men of the household. She should be okay because she has two sons. But we see a problem. It says in verse 4, they marry Moabite women. Again, forbidden. You're not supposed to marry outside of the tribe of Israel. One's named Orpah, the other named Ruth. This was, again, probably not the best decision. The Moabites were forbidden from joining worship with the Israelites. So there is inherently going to be a religious conflict in this family. I mean, effectively, these two guys marrying these two women would be like, say we had somebody in our community who tried to burn the building down and kill a bunch of our church members, right? Right? And then your daughter wanted to go marry him. That's kind of the relationship we have going here with the Moabites, right? They're the enemy. And yet these sons take in the ladies for wives. It's going to cause problems. It's going to have conflict. They're going to raise their families, and what are they going to be able to do? They're not going to be able to go to temple worship. They're not going to be able to return to Israel and bring the wives in with them. These women are, in all likelihood, worshippers of Chemosh, or at least of some other god. And in some ways, this falls back on their father. He's the one who brought them there. Who, who were they going to marry, right? It wasn't like they could jump on the express mule and go back to Israel and find a lady. They're 50 miles away. That doesn't sound like much to us, but 50 miles away back in this day and age is basically the other side of the world for most people. I mean, just just a matter of a generation or two ago here in America, 50 miles away might have been the other side of the world for most people, right? 
A hundred years ago, people didn't travel a lot. Thousands of years ago, most people didn't move more than 10, 12 miles outside of the circle of where they lived. And so Elimelech's decisions are having a lasting impact on his family. And the story continues. And it says, after they'd been living there for about 10 years, both sons die. So why had Elimelech moved them there? To avoid death. What has happened the entire story? Death. Right? Both he and his sons die in Moab. And God is saying here at one of the lowest points in the spiritual history of Israel that we find the sweetheart of a woman burying her husband and then her two sons. Uh, Her heart had to be broken. She was in a tough spot. She was in a culture where she couldn't just run to town and, and go get a job and provide for herself. Not an option. And in the midst of her grief, what is she to do? And when I think of Naomi in this period, it actually makes me think of Job an awful lot, right? Of the pain, of the suffering, of the just tremendous loss that Job experienced and how his heart had to be broken. How is she going to respond in this situation? Verses 5 and 6. We see that there, that, that Naomi gets word, things are starting to pick up back in her homeland, right? Back in Bethlehem. Things are getting better. Sounds like the rains are falling, the drought is lifting, the crops will start to grow. So, with little to no hope where she's living in Moab, she says, all right, I'm going home. So she packs up her bags and she starts to trek back to Bethlehem. (coughs) Excuse me. And we see here for the very first time in the story... God in the story. The very first mention of God comes at this point. And here it is that we find this overarching theme of the book of Ruth. The providence of God. That the Lord had come to the aid of his people and was providing food for them. If you read the story of Ruth, you will see in it a microcosm of everything that was going on in Israel of that time. The, the story of Ruth in about four pages tells this long story of, of all of the period of Judges. It, it, it's, in fact, a beautiful summary. And the providence of God, the provision of God, that God is taking care of his people, his fingerprints are all over the story. But let me explain about the providence of God real quick. Because Sometimes I think when we think of the providence of God, we think of God doing big and amazing things, right? But more often than not, the providence of God is God working quietly in the details, in the background, where we don't even notice in the moment. Someday when we turn and we look back, we go, oh yeah, God was there. So many times in my life I find this to be true, right? Maybe you do as well. I don't see God working in my life. I don't see God protecting me or helping me make good decisions or or all the the different things that God provides for me. But then a year, five years, ten years down the road, I look back and I go, wow, God was really in those details. I didn't even know it at the time. He was protecting me or he was providing for me or he was showing his love for me or he brought this right person at the right time into my life. And what a difference that made. That's the providence of God. And in fact, he works in all of our lives. You don't have to be somebody special. God God is providentially working in each and every one of our lives, transforming us so that we may follow after him if we will. We are all very normal and average people, but God is still at work in our lives. In verse 7, and this is where we're going to pick up and we're going to cover some ground here quickly. Verse 7, we see Naomi turning away from the errors of her husband in the past. And in a sense, turning her back on Moab is visually, for us, a sign of repentance. She's literally turning her life around and heading back to home. In verses 8 and 9, marriage means security for women. And yet, ironically, we see Ruth here 
giving up the possibility of marriage, probably, by going with Ruth, or with Naomi. In the passage here, it says this. It says that as Naomi decides to go back, right, it says that Ruth clings to her and wants to go with her. Orpah says, nah, I think I'll stay here. And for her, that was probably the right choice because when she goes to Israel, if Orpah goes to Israel, she should not be able to find a husband. She's a Moabite. So she's doing the right thing, saying, I'm going to provide for myself. I'm going to stay back here where there's people and men and my family and my friends. Go ahead. See you later. You've been a, a sweetheart, Naomi. We love you. But goodbye. Ruth, on the other hand, Ruth, on the other hand, is this tremendous example of faithfulness. When Naomi's hitting the road, Ruth could stay, but she says, no, you know what? I'm following you. I'm, I'm trusting you, Naomi, and through trusting you, I'm putting my trust in your God because your God is going to be my God. Your people are going to become my people. And in fact, Naomi... Uh, Ruth goes so far as to say, if, if I go back on this or if I violate this or if I, if I get waylaid or whatever, may your God's wrath come down upon me, right? So Ruth and Naomi trek back to Bethlehem. Naomi rebukes the girls and, and tries to give them the out, but they don't. one takes it, one doesn't. And Ruth continues on with Naomi, and jumping ahead to verse 13 and 14. As we return here in verse 13 and 14 to Bethlehem, Orpah is left behind with her God and her people. Ruth is moving forward in faith with Naomi. Now when you read this passage in 13 and 14, it talks about, as I mentioned, Ruth clinging. This terminology is used exclusively elsewhere in Scripture for the clinging sort of bond in marriage. That's the depth of relationship that Ruth shows towards Naomi. And when they get to Bethlehem, we're going to see this, Ruth takes on this position as provider for Naomi. Naomi doesn't make it easy, we see in verse 15, for Ruth to come with, but Ruth says, nonetheless, I'm coming with you, your gods will be my gods, your people will be my people. Not even anything's going to separate us. Nothing but death, Ruth says in 16, right? And I think the reason for this is Naomi, being a sweetheart, being such a tremendous woman, has inspired through her character this confidence in Ruth. And then in verse 17, to to seal Ruth's level of commitment, as I said, she invokes God's judgment upon her if she breaks this loyalty to Naomi. And I would say in this moment when she invokes this curse upon herself, if she runs away, if she turns away, if she doesn't follow Yahweh God and be part of Naomi's people, I would say at that point, she has kind of switched teams, right? She's had this spiritual regeneration. Her conversion is complete. And all of the events for the rest of the book will reflect that in the story. 18 and 19, as you're reading at home, if you go and read the story, you'll see it must have been a somewhat dangerous trip for them back. And we also see when they get back to Bethlehem, the years away must have taken a toll on Naomi because the time away have altered the way that she looks. And when we get to verse 20, we see the women talking to the women. We see Naomi and Ruth talking with the women of Bethlehem. And they're like, oh yeah, Naomi, we remember you. What does Naomi say though? She says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Verse 20, she says, call me Mara. You know what Mara means? It means I'm bitter. Again, when you're walking around introducing yourself to people, hi, how are you? I'm bitter. Okay. Interesting choice of names there. But she says, I'm bitter. She was bitter towards her lot in life. She'd lost her two sons. She'd lost her husband. Suffering. But in spite of her suffering, hear this. She remained faithful. 
despite all that she had suffered. In 21, she says, I went away full. I went away two sons, husband, I had hope, but I come back empty. I'm widowed, I'm childless, I'm poor. I got nothing but the shirt on my back. That's why she's bitter. And she comes back to the town of Bethlehem, which of course we know Bethlehem, but Bethlehem is a town pregnant with meaning. Who's going to be born there? Jesus, right? This is a good place to be. And she comes back and it's the beginning of the harvest. Why does that matter? Because it's a symbol of hope. It's a whole new season in Israel. And maybe a new season in the lives of Naomi and Ruth. She had returned empty-handed, but she has Ruth the Moabite with her, and the harvest was ripe. There was hope even if she didn't know it at this point. Let me wrap all of this up and then we'll get out of here. As your pastor, I love you guys very much, and I say this sincerely. There is some tremendous lessons to be learned here. First, I think one of the great lessons to be learned is spiritually to be open and honest like Naomi. If, if things are rough, if you're suffering, and if life is hard, it is okay to say, you know, right now I'm a little bitter. Most of us are too proud to say that though, aren't we? When we're suffering, we kind of want to suffer alone. When we're suffering, when we're hurting, we kind of want to hide that from our church family. We want to come in with our church clothes on, with our church smile on. Oh, everything's great, Pastor. Right? Not Naomi. Naomi says, quit calling me sweetheart. Call me bitter. Because I am bitter. I am frustrated. I am I'm even maybe angry with the Lord. I still love him and he's still my God, but boy, am I angry. And that's okay. It has to be okay because it's in the Bible. So I think we need to be more transparent with one another and love one another and and allow each other the space and the grace when life isn't going as planned to be Mara, to be honest. As you read through these stories, as you follow along in this, try to identify who do you relate with in this story. Do you relate to Elimelech in this story? Elimelech is that guy who says, I got this, right? I can do this on my own. I can take care of this by myself. I don't need anybody else's help. My family needs food. I can fix that, right? I don't need you, God. I'll go down the road, 50 miles. We'll take care of it. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. You ever heard that? Yeah? Uh, That's a Limelech. And some of you, maybe all of you, at some point in time will relate to that part of the story. You know, it's that mentality that, hey Jesus, I'll just call you when I need you. I got this. How many of you are like Orpah? Maybe you've been there in your life where you said, I tried this faith thing, I tried this relationship thing, but it didn't work, so... I'm going back to my old ways, to my old gods, to the way things were before, because I liked those better. Right? I'm Orpa. Maybe you're Ruth, as you read through this story. And if you are Ruth, let me know, because I want to buy you coffee and just hear your story about how you're trusting in the Lord and walking with the Lord in amazing faith. Right? And that's okay. At times... Many of us will be Ruth. And then as I was kind of pointing to a little moment ago, how many of us are Naomi? Where we're a little bit cranky, a little bit angry. You know, we're Mara. We're not the sweetheart Naomi. We're frustrated with where God has put us. But yet we love God deeply still. And if we're honest we will probably find ourselves in each one of these positions at different points in our lives. As we read through the story, we will see God as the capital H hero. But Naomi and Ruth, and eventually Boaz, are also heroes. This is such a beautiful story, folks. It's a love story. 
It's a microcosm of the story of Israel. It's a story of redemption. It is the best example in the Old Testament of what is to come in the New Testament. It is a beautiful thing. And so I'm excited to be on this venture. I hope you're excited to be on this adventure. And it only gets better from here. So let's pray and we'll get out of here.